well, my name is Austin Hildebrand. I am the Vice President of Operations for the Student Business Leadership Academy. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance this evening. Uh, just as a reminder, if you are planning on receiving extra credit for more than one class, you do need to fill out a separate slip for each class. And after, um, after our guest speaker is done, there is tubs that you can put the slips in after she's done. And at this point in time, I'd like to bring up Kyle Nobles, the SPLA president, to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. I guess, like you said, I am the president of SBA. Um, Crystal DeHaan was born in the Bavarian region of Germany during World War II. She grew up in this area and experienced many of the hardships associated with the post-war country. It is there that she developed her legendary work ethic and appreciation for the arts. In 1962, she moved her family to Indianapolis. Within 12 years of arriving to the United States, Crystal, along with John DeHaan, founded Resorts Condominiums International. RCI grew to become the largest timeshare vacation exchange in the world. In 1989, Mr. Hahn became the chairman, CEO, and so owner of RCI. The company was reported to be valued at approximately $850 million. In 1996, she sold RCI to Sedan Corporation and began her career as one of the nation's leading philanthropists, patron of the arts, and educators. She founded Crystal House International, which has built schools for poor children in Mexico City, South Africa, India, Croatia, Venezuela, and even Indianapolis. Her credentials are countless, but include such highlights as sitting on a presidential task force, being inducted into the British Tourism Hall of Fame, and serving as the chair of the Board of Trustees of the United States of sorry, of the University of Indianapolis, my father. Plus, we all know her for her tremendous generosity and for the building that bears her name, the Crystal DeHaan Fine Arts Center. Please join me in welcoming one of the nation's most successful entrepreneurs and philanthropists, Crystal DeHaan. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I would like to start my comments with a philosophical statement. I'm sure that many of you have heard the phrase that the future of any country lies in the hands of its young people. What you learn, what you think, what you feel, and what ultimately defines you is what our country is all about. That you are here this evening is an indicator that you have aspirations and goals, and I wish you much, much success in achieving those. As business students, you are no doubt familiar with American business magnet, author, and former chemical engineer, Jack Lausch. He was chairman of CEO of and CEO of General Electric between 1981 and 2001. During his tenure at GE, the company's value rose 4,000%. I like what he says about leadership. Before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, Success is about growing others, end quote. We are all at some point of Jack Welch's continuum 
But I, not, I do not believe these are mutually exclusive. Growing ourselves and growing others really needs to occur in tandem throughout our lifetimes. My own life's journey has followed and continues to follow very, very much a dual track. Challenging myself and learning uh, and, uh, to, to learn and to grow has been a lifelong mission of mine. And it gives me great joy to work with people who have a similar philosophy, as it is through the effort of overcoming challenges that we discover strengths we didn't think we had. It is an important catalyst of growth and development. I much respect Dr. Will and the passion he has for mentoring his students and exposing them to experiences which will shape their attitudes and thinking. He's passionate about business, about finance, and about entrepreneurship. So I have focused my remarks this evening on entrepreneurship from both a for-profit and non-profit perspective. Entrepreneurship has played a significant role in my life, enabling me to create two successful business models, one in commerce and one in the non-for-profit sector. There are many definitions about entrepreneurship. I define it rather simply, such as people who are willing and able to convert an idea into a successful undertaking, or who are willing to try again when the first attempt fails. Willing to take risks, relentless in their pursuit of transforming an idea into reality, who have fire in the belly and call out all stops to make something happen, willing to work long and hard and who draw from a reservoir of creativity and resourcefulness. The question of whether entrepreneurs are made over a period of time or are born is often debated. My belief is that most entrepreneurs have a predispositioning. Of course, opportunity and environments play a role. But the main driver is still natural ability and throughout my life, I have had the opportunity to meet many entrepreneurs, and I have found one common thread among them. Most are driven by one overarching principle to succeed and to make successful what they have started. Most never had as a goal uh, the desire to become wealthy. So you see the difference here. The entrepreneur has an idea, wants to pursue it. He or she is not going to say, I'm going to be a multi, multi, multi millionaire. I just want to get started, get going, and prove that my idea uh, can become a reality. So I began my entrepreneurial journey in 1974, which no doubt sounds like the dark ages to all of you sitting in the room. <laughs> you can figure out how old I am, right? That was the year when John Dehan and I co-founded RCI. And as you heard in the uh, introduction, uh, it was a service, a business that pioneered vacation exchange as a tool to help resort developers find a solution to an overbuilt real estate market. Now, all of you in this room know about the financial market crisis we had in 2008 and the struggle to get our economy moving forward. In the 70s, the economic conditions in our country were also incredibly difficult. Interest rates were close to 11%. The rate of inflation was some 12% and the country encountered an oil embargo that resulted in significant shortages of gasoline. People would line up, wait for a long time to fuel their cars, think for a moment 
would you have wanted to start a company which was pioneering a new concept under those conditions? But that is exactly what we did. So our vision was to provide the real estate market with a sales tool that would make the purchase of resort condominiums more attractive to consumers. We would form a network of affiliated resorts and the individual uh, condominium purchaser would become a RCI member and have exchange rights with other members in the network on an international basis. So we designed this exchange product with a two-pronged approach to provide developers a unique marketing and sales tool and conversely to offer flexibility and variety to the end consumer. For a fee similar to a franchise fee, developers could affiliate their resorts with the RCI network. In return, when a sale was made, the developer enrolled the new purchaser as an RCI member and paid the first year membership fee. Now, I might just add a comment also. When you think about a membership, a membership generally um, is a, a low um, dollar item. And if we would have gone directly to the market to try to attempt that, that piece of the, uh, then that piece of the RCI model would not have worked. What was the brilliance about working with developers and have the developer first become successful by making a sale, but when the sale was made, the developer provided automatically a member to RCI. That was the unique, unique aspect of the, the RCI uh, business model. So, after the first year, when a member was uh, enrolled in RCI, going forward, RCI members then renewed their membership fees on a voluntary basis. In other words, we had to prove ourselves that the services we provided met their expectation because if you have a satisfied consumer, a consumer will come back time and time and time again. So, for all of your um, finance majors, let me tell you, the company was capitalized with the mighty awesome amount of money of $7,000. For the first six months, our office was located in our home. Imagine answering the phone, Resort Condominiums International, when sometimes the washer and dryer um, was running in the background. <laughs> Our first year's revenues amounted to $14,000, hardly encouraging enough to call this a viable business. But we stuck with it, not only because giving up was not an option when things were getting tough, but also because a new product was being introduced into the US real estate market. It was called resort time sharing developed by the French in the 60s, but without the exchange component. So with resort time sharing, a buyer could purchase a vacation home or a condominium for one or two or three weeks. Um, the purchaser would own that unit for a specified number of years or even in perpetuity. Since purchases of timeshares only bought the number of weeks they would use every year for vacation purposes, timesharing became an innovative way of making resort vacations available to the massive middle class market. A whole new dream of vacationing was opening up to consumers who in the past only knew of roadside motels or staying with friends and family uh, on vacation. The economics of time sharing had great appeal. A developer could sell 50 weeks to 50 different purchasers, and RCI could conceivably gain 50 new members for each unit sold. The product was affordable, but it had its limitations. The purchaser was restricted to use the same time year after year at the same resort in the same unit. 
So RCI brought that solution. The purchases had variety and flexibility by exchanging to other resorts at different times and at different locations. <laughs> The exchange was the missing link to making timesharing succeed as a product. Timesharing needed RCI, and RCI needed timesharing in order to grow and to reach scale. <clears throat> Looking back, a part of our success can be attributed to things you'll never find in a business textbook. One, we were unencumbered by what we didn't know, and two, we operated out of sheer belief that we simply must succeed. From the beginning, we were determined to be a global company. Now, you know, think back in the 70s, that was not as much in vogue as it is today. Our strategy was think global and act global, and this was long before the business literature advocated such practices. In the early stages of timesharing, the industry encountered some serious <coughs> abuses, and RCI became a huge catalyst in supporting legislation that was carefully balanced, protecting the consumer on the one hand, and on the other hand, fostering the growth of the industry. So that's where uh, what needs to occur in, in, in most all business undertaking. How can we generate end consumers? How can these consumers be protected and at the same time allow a market or an enterprise uh, or a sector to grow and flourish? Our operating uh, philosophy was based on ethics and transparency. RCI voluntarily had its operating statistics audited by an international auditing firm long before it became law. We publish these audits in our literature so as to provide accurate information to our customers and to prospective purchasers. Timesharing at that time was a fledgling industry. So RCI needed to stimulate interest in the real estate and tourism markets to look at timesharing as the vacation product of the future. It was a simple economic equation. RCI received a new member every time somebody purchased a timeshare. We opened our first international office in Mexico in 1975, one year after we were founded. A European office in London in 1977, and we expanded to Japan and Australia in the early 80s. By 1994, RCI had 38 offices worldwide. This gave us an in-country presence to service resorts and members located there, and it also enabled us to support and influence the development of the industry. Our international strategy served us well. At the time I sold the company, close to 50% of revenues came from the international subsidiaries. RCI became the gold standard in the industry. It was recognized for its performance delivery, integrity, innovation, and customer service. How did we do this? We created a corporate culture that thrived on excellence. We valued and rewarded our employees. We invested heavily in training and technology. We computerized our manual exchange system in 1977, way ahead of market trends. We were highly competitive, highly ethical in our contact, and fostered a spirit of teamwork and global understanding. We anticipated market needs, and we knew that our success rested on making our resort clients uh, make, uh, uh, more successful. We valued our RCI members and recognized early on that it is financially more advantageous to keep a customer than to produce a new customer. 
so customer satisfaction was paramount. We bought out the original investors in 1977 at a time when the company was still struggling financially. We had an excellent reputation as an employer of choice, a company driven by innovation, as a company that was reliable and customer focused. We enhanced our revenue base by providing multiple year discounted membership fees, which helped finance our expansion and contributed greatly to our profitability. That was another brilliant stroke of the RCI model, to be able to um, generate um, cash to finance our own internal expansion by, um, with, 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 um, by, by offering these multiple uh, membership uh, discounts. So the consumer benefited and RCI benefited. We made it easy for our customers to do business with us and we had nearly an 80% market share, even though our closest competitor was only two years younger than RCI. So you can see the difference here. If you have all the things I'm talking about, and you're driven by excellence, and you deliver on your promise, because in the end, everyone expects you to deliver on the promise, um, and you have a creative business model, you have an incredible opportunity to gain huge, huge market share. And I might also add, you know, it also helped having been the first one. That, uh, you know, we led the pack with innovation and we were out of the gates very fast and it was very difficult for someone else to catch up with us. So fast forward to today. The timeshare product has proven itself incredibly resilient. It has survived economic ups and downs, recessions, regulatory interventions, lack of capital for consumer financing, and disasters such as earthquakes, fires, and floods. It has seen consolidation and the emergence of vacation clubs, points, crews, and airline exchanges, and rentals. Today, millions of people around the world own and enjoy timeshare vacations. In 1996, I was approached by Wall Street financier Henry Solomon, who at that time was the darling of Wall Street. He was very eager to purchase RCI, and the question I had to ask myself, was I ready to do so? I could see that the next step in RCI's growth would be to be a part of a New York Stock Exchange listed company. The sale resulted in a 650 million transaction and a 200 million workout, and it was handled without an investment company. A credit to my internal team at RCI. Again, we simply just did it. I regard myself as a classic example of the American dream. What does this really mean? Simply defined, it was about understanding a need in the marketplace and devising a product that would fulfill that need. It was about hard work. It was stressful. And there were many sacrifices. And there were sleepless nights. A number of things contributed to RCI success. As you evaluate what you want to achieve in your life, maybe these pointers will be helpful to you. First, I learned to believe in myself, to trust my instincts, and to take calculated risks. I always try to exceed expectations and to produce quality work. I always emphasize good character and ethics. In the end, it is all about reputation. 
I knew it was wrong to give up when the going got tough. I learned that it is okay to make mistakes as long as we learn from them and don't repeat them. And I knew that every RCI employee contributed to the success of the company. When the sale was closed, every RCI employee received a special bonus paid on years of service. And in totality, and, uh, it amounted to 20% uh, uh, percent of the purchase price. I was willing to share with the employees who, help, who have helped so much in making RCI a success. So when that happens, you share and you give back and you say a big thank you. I left RCI in 1997 and in 1998 I started a new entrepreneurial venture, Crystal House. I wanted to use my business experience and financial resources to create not market capital, but human capital. I wanted to create something that was intergenerational and transformational. Early in 1998, I was asked to support children in a Mexican shelter. There wasn't enough money to pay for the food, for the staff. It was a very dire decision, uh, situation. I went to assess the situation and found 135 children crowded into a small house in Mexico City with little opportunity to maximize their human potential. Uh, 35 adolescent boys living in the countryside about two hours outside of Mexico City who lived in an environment that offered no pathway to a better life. The impact of this trip will remain etched in my mind forever. The environment of these children was not conducive to learn, to develop, or to acquire skills that would make them self-sufficient and productive human beings. The cycle of poverty would just continue from one generation to the next. I realized that giving money would make life somewhat easier for these children, but inherently nothing would change. Here is where the concept of Crystal House was born. I wanted to create a model that would address the systemic causes and the debilitating effects resulting from poverty, poor health, isolation, abuse, and abandonment. I wanted to create a model that would transition these children from a life of hopelessness and despair into a life of self-sufficiency, independence, and productivity. I wanted to give impoverished children the opportunity to optimize their human potential and to have a seat at the table of life. I used the same approach to start Crystal House as was used with RCI. We just did it. And we didn't get tangled up with things we didn't yet know. But I did know that education has always been the equalizer, the pathway to a, a, a better life. That hungry kids were impaired in learning that physical and emotional health needed to be attended, that children needed to feel loved and supported, and that parents needed to understand that learning equates with earning. So we got started. Aside from, a rigor uh, from a, a, a rigorous academics, we focused on values, character and life skill development, service learning, and setting high expectations. And because we were not a residential school, our kids go home every night to their slums and informal settlements, um, we would work also with parents to improve their parenting skills to make better mentors. 
Our goal was not only to have educated children, but young adults who understood the importance of giving back to society and becoming self-sufficient and good citizens of their country. I had a little while before I came here the pleasure of sitting with um, your uh, uh, classmates and college um, mates and listening to them and their service learning projects they have undertaken. And I tell you, it warmed my heart to see you young people be so engaged in giving back and also caring for others. At Crystal House, we acknowledge the poverty of our students, but employ a no exclusive philosophy. Uh, we combine that with huge measures of love for our children. We teach them to face life with hope and optimism. And all Crystal House children have dreams. They see themselves as teachers, nurses, attorneys, singers, dancers, and socket and cricket players. And they know that Crystal House is their road to success. I believe that each of us has a responsibility to give back to our community and to make the world a better place. Crystal House kids learn this from the first day to come to Crystal House. Every student and every classroom participates in community projects. Some collect recyclables, some clean beaches, some gather emergency supplies for victims of natural disasters. Some visit cancer patients or homes for the elderly. All Crystal House children learn to give. In the years since that visit to Mexico, we have accomplished a great deal. Today, we serve over 4,000 children and young adults through our learning centers in Mexico City, in Bangalore and La Vassa, India, Cape Town, South Africa, Caracas, Venezuela, and yes, Crystal House Academy and Crystal House Doors, a dropout recovery school right here in Indianapolis. And let me just say a word or two about that. You know, barely 50% of students in the Indianapolis public school system graduate. So you can imagine how many students um, are starting life without the tools uh, they need to have. A di diploma is essential in, in today's world. All of you have the good fortune to come to university. But if you don't have a high school diploma, um, the future of a young person is, is, is a very, very, very gloom. So we feel a real calling to not only helping the young and bringing them through at the Crystal House um, way of schooling, um, but those who are older and need a boost in life to get back on the right track we think we are doing a tremendous social service to help these young adults and not so young adults because we have students uh, ranging in age from 18 to 52 at Crystal House Door. So that gives us some idea how challenging this environment is. Now, when we look at our kids, I can tell you with the pride of a mother of 4,000 children uh, and adults, that they are living, breathing example that the Crystal House model works. They stay in school, they graduate. Crystal House South Africa has had for four years in a row a 100% graduation rate. Crystal House India a 98% graduation rate. And uh, the majority of them have gone on to colleges and universities. Um, and we already have university graduates because in Venezuela we started taking in the children at uh, an older age. So we already have cohorts of university graduates. 
Uh, they are sought after as employees because Crystal House kids comport themselves. They know that they have a responsibility to be a dignified human being and that in their interaction they have great manners, they show appreciation. It's all about developing the total uh, person. And now as they are studying or working and studying, they are helping their parents, siblings and friends and neighbors to improve their life. They are truly proving that if impoverished children are given a caring environment, receive an excellent education, have enough to eat, and receive regular health care, they will optimize their human potential. All they need is a helping hand and an opportunity and to be in an environment where no excuses are practiced where they feel loved and appreciated, and where they set their visions very, very high and are encouraged and motivated <laughs> to pursue that. So you may ask the question, what do RCI and Crystal House have in common? There is truly a common link. Each organization has improved the quality of life for the people it touched. RCI became a catalytic force in helping create a new sector in the tourism industry. Similarly, Crystal House transforms the lives of impoverished children and by so doing will make self-sufficiency possible for generations that follow. I know of no organization that takes in a child at the age of five and supports that child no longer a child, until the age of 22 and 23, when our graduates are finished with their work study phase of their life. Both enterprises are pioneering efforts. RCI, the inventor of vacation exchange, became a catalyst to propel the timeshare industry, and Crystal House, a pioneer of a comprehensive model of human transformation, is proving itself as a highly effective poverty alleviation program. I'd like to close today with some thoughts about my own philosophies of life. These values and beliefs have guided my actions and deeds, and you may find some of them helpful as you chart your own path for the future. Seek balance in your life. It starts first with working hard, and when you have done so, celebrate and enjoy life. Don't invert the two. <laughs> Look at work as a privilege and not as a right. Start each day with a positive state of mind. Embrace the world and its people. <coughs> We are all members of the human family. Don't give up when it gets tough. Be tenacious, stick it out. Be a lifelong learner. Have passions in your life. Whether it's the arts, business, helping others. Be engaged in something that excites you intellectually and gives you emotional satisfaction. Be thankful for what you have and remind yourself of it daily. Always look for opportunities. Don't wait for opportunities to come to you. You go out and you look for them. Be an entrepreneur, anticipate needs, be a leader. Embrace excellence. Put your bar very high. Don't do anything that is average. It's easy to be average. But you want to be better than average. And that comes because you have high standards and in everything you want to do, you want to find excellence. Accept occasional failure as part of your education in life and part of the price of success. 
keep pressing forward and pursue your dreams. Surround yourself with people of good character, as they will always contribute positively to you and to society. Make integrity and ethics your constant companion. Take prudent risks and be courageous. Care, share, and make a difference. That's sort of my motto. Give of your time, talent, and energy, and resources to help make the world a better place. When you do, you'll find a satisfaction with life that is particularly enriching and rewarding. You are giving a wonderful opportunity here at UAMB to prepare you for the next step in your life. Make the most of it. You will need to have a laser sharp focus on what is next. What will you be doing? Where are your strengths? How can they be leveraged? Do you have enough fire in the belly and skills and talents to become what you seek out? Do you want to work in the social sector, in the business sector? Do you want to become an entrepreneur, create new products or a new service? Your future is in front of you, and the challenge for you is to carve out your definitive role. It may change in the future, but I urge you to put your stake in the ground and not only dream about your future, but actually make it happen. If you approach life from the premise of optimizing your skills and talents and committing to making the world a better place, you will not only establish your own path, but also help build a better world. And somehow, somewhere, and for someone, the world will be a better place because of you. Believe me, I know it. So to all of you in this room, my best wishes to each of you in all of your professional endeavors and much joy in your personal life. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Questions. Um, so, if you have a question, I will bring the microphone around to you. Raise your hand. Can you please hold it down still? Questions? Don't be shy. All right, come on up. Do you see your model for the Crystal House? expanding into public education and is society ready for it and is the political landscape ready for it? Um, yes, the answer is yes because uh, all crystal houses in, the, uh, in Mexico and uh, India and South Africa and Venezuela are really private charity schools if I can coin a, a term for that. But the Crystal Houses in Indianapolis, Crystal House Academy, and Crystal House Doors are chartered by the mayor of Indianapolis. So we already work in the public space. And we have proven that we can take the children from the most um, impoverished area and set them on a trajectory um, to, to, to success. Our Crystal House Academy kids have way surpassed the Indiana averages on ISTEP score. Uh, you know, one measurement how well a school is doing. There are obviously many other measurements that one has to take into consideration. The satisfaction of teachers, attendance, uh, retention rate, all of these measurements that we pay close, close attention to. But um, yes, so we are in the public space and we can say it's working. Ms. Dion, thank you for coming today. Uh, my question is, how much more satisfaction do you get from your efforts with Crystal House and helping others than you did with, our, uh, with RCI? Even though both have very hard, been very hard, one was very hard work and I'm sure that what you're doing now is very hard work. 
Well, it's um, there are different sources of satisfaction. Uh, you know, RCI became a big multinational company, and um, and it was hugely exciting to create a commercial enterprise that was that successful. When I look today uh, at RCI uh, uh, for two very, very meaningful purposes, um, I had a great love in my heart for the RCI people. I built with them, and that was a tough thing when I sold the company to say goodbye to that. But by having sold the company, it gave me the resources to start Crystal House. And so I look at Crystal House sort of as this hugely significant work that will come about not from creating a commercial success, but from giving young people the opportunity to have that uh, seat at the table of life. And that psychic gratification is so enormous when you see we have transitioned children from over here to over there, and they will be able to provide for their families and generations to follow in a way that no one could have done before had they not been uh, to Crystal House. So I think this is my, signif my most significant piece of work. Hi, Ms. Han. Um, my question for you tonight is, uh, what compels you to make the world a better place? You know, even though you had to work so hard to make a living in your life, was, you know, I, mean, I, I read some things about you on the internet. It just seems like you, you're just a warrior. I mean, what compels you then to give back after the world was so hard? Well, I think and many, many reasons. You know, I was born during World War II. Uh, my father got killed in the war one month before the war ended. And if you grow up, or if you grew up in post-war Germany, it was a very, very difficult time. I learned from very, very early on to be very appreciative, appreciative and very grateful for the smallest little things. You know, if you got a bar of chocolate for your birthday, that was about it during the year. Uh, forget about going to McDonald's and all those kinds of things with which you grew up. That wasn't in the cart. Uh, there wasn't an automobile, so you walked in bike to everything. Um, there was no television. Uh, there were many things that are just so standard in your life today that I didn't have. And all of these were discoveries for me as I grew older and got uh, exposed to it. And I had a mother who was a um, very caring person uh, teaching us the importance of giving back. My mother always would invite somebody else who had less than me had and have a, 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 a dinner. Um, or she would donate to charities, even though there wasn't a whole lot to go around in all those years. So we grew up with that, with that um, understanding that um, living a purposeful and meaningful life has a greater purpose than just living for yourself. And you know, when you've gone through those experiences, uh, it's, I think then, you know, it, it was very easy for me to say, oh, I've achieved commercial success, and isn't it wonderful that I can now help children who would have never had an opportunity to do something for them that is life-changing. And you know, in the end, the giver ends up as the receiver. I know I'm giving, but oh my God, am I getting back a lot. And that makes me very, very happy. So it's a long-winded answer to your question, <laughs> but this is really where it all came from. Well, we're going to end on that note. And uh, Mr. Hahn, before you leave, I'd like to invite the vice presidents, um, all of the vice presidents, and Kyle up to the podium. Um, we 
the students always give a gift to our speaker. And the students came to me and they said, you know what, what do you give to the person who has everything? So these six people decided they would go out and do a fundraising campaign for Crystal the House and they raised $1,000 for Crystal House. Oh, no. oh, my Oh, and good luck to all of you, okay? And make the most out of it.